Chapter 9. It is not what happens to you, but your attitude toward the happening that determines your happiness. Unknown. The zodiac races across the choppy water, while I cling desperately to its wildly balancing rubber hull. Jean-Michel Cousteau is at the throttle, and he is a man in a hurry. A large pod of humpback whales is moving rapidly through the water several hundred yards off to our port. Jean-Michel wants to get well ahead of them so we can be waiting in their path and ready to film when they go by. The Zodiac rockets off a cresting swell. For a heart-thumping moment, I'm airbound, airborne. Then the inflatable slams back into the water. I see the rubber, black rubber hull rushing up to meet my face. The impact nearly throws me into the water. Get ready, shouts Jean Michel. I glance over at our cinematographer, Michel Delory, who is eagerly watching the approaching whales. I, too, can't wait to get in the water. I've never swam with whales before and am bubbling with enthusiasm as I clutch my Nikonios underwater camera to my chest. Now, shouts Jean-Michel as he cuts the engine. We quickly roll out of the boat, hitting the water. I begin kicking as fast as possible and am completely surprised to see the Zodiac drifting slowly ahead of me. Why am I not going anywhere? I wonder, then am abruptly aware of what is wrong. Where are your fins? shouts Jean-Michel. Floating helplessly in the water, I'm completely embarrassed. In the excitement of the pursuit, I have forgotten to put on my swim fins. Jean-Michel quickly grabs them from the floorboards of the Zodiac and holds them just beyond my reach. How is it possible that my new chief diver could forget his little flippers? Jean-Michel is greatly enjoying this moment. With a snorkel jammed in my mouth, there is little I can say. Not that anything suitable comes to mind. So instead, I lunge for the fins and quickly begin strapping them on. You better hurry, laughs Jean Michel. I don't think the whales are going to wait for you. Taking a deep breath, I dive quickly beneath the water. Below, I see Michel Delory swim upwards, but there is no sign of the whales. He grins at me as he holds up one thumb victoriously. He is obviously ecstatic. We surface together at the side of the Zodiac. Incredible, Michel Delory beams to Jean Michel, hoisting, him, hoisting himself into the inflatable boat. There are dozen, a dozen of them, mostly big bulls. Any calves? Jean Michel asked hopefully. Yes, Michel Delory answered in his rich French accent. A very little one, just a baby, maybe two or three weeks old. As I pull myself despondently into the zodiac, Michel Delory looks curiously in my direction. Where were you? he asks. The whales let me get quite close to them. My new chief diver forgot his flippers, Jean-Michel Cousteau answers flatly. Really? Michel Delory is grinning hugely. You forgot your fins. But how is that possible? You are a chief diver. Do you think we should tell Cindy? asks Jean-Michel, picking up a walkie-talkie. But of course, Michel Delory is enjoying himself immensely. You're not really going to tell Cindy. I can't believe this is happening. Cindy, my wife to be, is skippering our support boat. I can see it several miles in the distance, over toward the islands of Maui. Further off, I see 
a host of other boats and know that most of them are probably monitoring our radio transmission. Sandy, this is the Zodiac calling. Jean Michel smiles at me. Sandy, here comes the prompt reply. I thought you would like to know that Steve was so excited to swim with the whales, he forgot to put his fins on. Really? I distinctly hear Sandy giggling and a loud chuckle from one of the crew members in the background. How embarrassing. Sandy sounds delighted. You should have seen him. His finless feet were fluttering at warp speed, but he was slower than a drifting rubber boat. I think Jean Michel is trying to be entertaining for the rest of the listening audience on the other boats. Abruptly, Michel Delory points and shouts, The whales! They're coming back! We quickly redon our masks and fins, then, grabbing the cameras, Michelle Delory and I throw ourselves back into the water. Taking several quick breaths, we dive rapidly downward. At first, all I see is empty blue water. Then, less than a hundred yards away, I see the whales coming. A large cow is leading the pod. She is fully 45 feet long and weighs over a thousand pounds per foot. The other whales range around her. It is like watching a fleet of approaching 18-wheeler trucks. The humpback whales are absolutely huge and majestically beautiful. Swimming at the cow's side is the baby calf. Though only several weeks old, already she is the size of a minivan. At a depth of 50 feet, I level off and eagerly begin taking pictures. I am directly in the path of the approaching whales. I keep expecting the calf to shy away. Instead, she angles closer and passes just six feet from me. For a few seconds, I'm able to swim at her side. Like most newborn baby animals, she has large, innocent eyes. As she passes, she does a double playful kick with her tail. Is this an invitation to play? I wonder. Swimming as fast as possible, I try to keep pace but fall rapidly behind. I'm beside myself with excitement, yet need to return to the surface for a breath of air. Beginning to swim upward, I see two large bull whales slightly above me and headed in my direction. If they stay on their course, I will have to wait for them to pass. As if sensing my need for air, the whales begin to turn to the right. Though they are still passing above me, I can continue my ascent by angling to their left. I watch a huge whale pectoral fin glide past just feet away. Then the massive tail sweeps by. I can feel the force of the whale's underwater wake just before I break the surface, gasping for air. Back on the Zodiac, I tell Jean Michel how the whales actually seem to move to allow me a straighter so shot to the surface. I assure you that that was no accident. Jean Michel answers knowingly. Humpback whales almost always move to make way for a person in the water. I have even seen them purposely lift their pectoral fins out of the way to keep them from accidentally striking a diver who gets too close. In general, I think whales make better decisions about human beings than humans are making about whales. Considering the immense size of the two bull whales I just encountered, it is amazing to think that these two magnificent creatures purposefully change their course to make life a little easier on a tiny creature like me. Going back through the corridors of my memory, I remember another time I got in the way of something much bigger than me, only the encounter ended much differently. It was my first day of high school, and like a lot of other freshmen, I was frantically trying to find one of my classrooms. I was rushing along a narrow sidewalk, 
arms loaded with books, when a tall senior stepped purposefully into my way. By the size of the chest I ran into, he must have been a lineman for the varsity football team. An instant later, I and my books were airborne and headed for a hard landing in a thick hedge. The senior thought it was quite amusing and even laughed, but that didn't stop him from threatening to bust my head open for not watching where I was going. Our encounter, though damaging to my pride, wasn't really that big of a deal. Yet it bothered me th that the big lug was actually having a good time roughing up a kid half his size. The human being is the only animal capable of finding any enjoyment in cruelty, yet making right decisions in life is not complicated. Good choices lift us up, and bad choices pull us down. The Bible defines it much more eloquently. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are good, the whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? Matthew six twenty two to 24 The question of our happiness in life is dependent upon how we look at the world and how we view ourselves in it. If we purposefully allow ourselves to make mistakes, those poor choices can lead us down a very dark path indeed, a series of small mistakes unless interrupted in time, always leads to a chain of bigger mistakes. And before one knows it, the chains and the darkness become very real. In the dark, men break into houses, but by day they shut themselves in. They want nothing to do with the light. For all of them, deep darkness is their morning. They make friends with the terrors of darkness. My thoughts are interrupted by Jean Michel. You know, I've never seen a chief diver jump into the water before without his fins. I must have looked pretty foolish, I answered with a chuckle. Don't worry about it, Jean Michel grins. At least it isn't as bad as when you forgot all of the dive masks on our last expedition to the Cocos Islands. Jean Michel is referring to my first ex expedition with the Custode team. Like thousands of divers, I had recently offered my services to the Custode Society, not daring to hope that anything would come of it. Imagine my surprise when they not only called, but brought me in as chief diver. Several months ago, I had been in charge of taking a team to Cocos Islands, which is 300 miles from Costa Rica. We were halfway there aboard an 85-foot sailing schooner when we realized all of our dive masks had been left in a box at a Coast Guard base. We had to sail back to Costa Rica to retrieve eight lousy dive masks. As the chief diver, I naturally got full responsibility for the mistake, which is a point Jean Michel cheerfully reminds me of on a regular basis. Of the early lessons I learned in life is that one of the lessons, early lessons I learned in life is that we all will make mistakes. To err is a natural part of the learning process. Mistakes can and should be turned into building blocks from which we lay a strong foundation toward becoming better people. The point is to take a lesson from our mistakes and hopefully not repeat them. Happiness is found in being content to be yourself.